this up if you want to write this down. All right, so I won't lie. I love seeing that like the room is still full and it's it's dinner it's, or me. So I'm, I, I'm flattered. <laughs> I'm very flattered. <laughs> so so we do have time for some questions, but then after the questions, please give me like five extra minutes because there's actually several announcements. Um, so any questions? Anything online? Yeah. Okay. Online, they'd like to know, could you give an easy definition for state pain and trait pain? An easy definition? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, as a non-clinician, I would just say you, what, what we do operationally is state pain is the pain that you're, your current pain that you're feeling at this moment. We ask people, what's your pain right now? The um, trait pain, it's... Um, the way we're doing it now is uh, when patients come to the clinics, they tend to fill out these questionnaires that say, what was your average pain over the last month? And that, that we just use as, as, as their trait pain. That's really not a good way of doing it. Um, what we're doing now and what a lot of people are doing now is everyone's, everyone's got apps, right? So patients now, um, they rate their pain on an app many, many times during the day. And then there's ways uh, that we could then decide how to determine what their trait pain is based on an average standard deviation, whatever, over, over a long period of time. So. All Thank you, Dr. I'll Davis, that's great. Yep. Um, distraction is a big go-to strategy that people teach in the clinic, and yep. my colleagues and I have landed on the side against teaching distraction as a daily coping strategy, but I was curious by the things you explored in your clinic on whether you have any commentary on, uh, and that this is where you're trying to go with your research, I saw yep. that, but, but currently what you know, whether we should encourage distraction in some and discourage in others based on something we can latch on to and what yeah, we see and how they I mean, talk about I think, their behaviors? I think it's fine to encourage it. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see any downside side except that I think um, what we're finding is that, you know, people, they're wired in a certain way. And some people um, without that instruction, without that training might be naturally um, just distractible or being being able to use that as a strategy. Other people, I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe we can switch. Be, like when I f first found this A and P thing, the first thing that the clinician said to me and the psychologist that worked with me said, can we, can we turn a P into an A? Um, and, and we started to do this CBT stuff. And it's like, well, I said, isn't that what you do with CBT all the time? They said, yeah, but not everybody responds to CBT. And it's like, oh, well, maybe you can't turn a P into an A, but maybe you can tweak them a little bit because there was a lot of fuzzy middle. There were people at the extremes and there were there was a lot of fuzzy middle. So maybe you can pull people a little bit to one side or the other. And, and maybe it's, it's a life experience. I mean, I, I, I also um, interact a lot with uh, pediatric pain researchers and I interact a lot with Christine Chambers and people other people people in Toronto and and you know what they what they're doing to for um, like the, the the needle pain in, in kids and all this kind of distraction stuff I, I think I think it's good when I get when I get a shot I look away I'm looking at something else yeah helps me so yeah you talked about um, where people are on the the spectrum you know, the different types. Have you looked at those people over time? Is there much variability in an individual over time yeah. with, with those kinds of traits, or are those more immutable than that? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. In fact, that's what um, kept us out of the, the highest journals with the, those studies, because they wanted us to prove that the, because we, we, we called them phenotypes, and they say, well, you only studied them once, how do you know, you know, and it's like, well, you know, we, we just can't do the study for another three years and keep bringing people in. But in fact, what we, what we did do in, in one of the studies, we did look at them twice because we studied them outside the scanner and then also they did the same thing inside the scanner and there was consistency there. So at least at two time points, uh, people were internally 
uh, consistent. But we have we haven't we haven't looked over over time. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, this is going to sound crazy, but I'll ask it anyways. I'm a big fan of the brain, but I got one too. But yeah. have you considered uh, in the? You know, we have this obsession and this focus on imaging the brain, but other systems in the body for finding pain, the yeah. heart, the yeah. gut, yeah. cellular level, because yeah, it probably is more than just the brain involved. Yeah, ab absolutely. So, um, well, you know, we chase down, a lot of people chase down the heart rate variability issue, um, not just for pain. Uh, I also do some work in the concussion area, and we thought that would be... Um, an indicator of concussion recovery, and it turned out to not really pan out. And um, so I think I think sure there there are you know the immune system right. There's there's I did a lot of work. Uh, one of the two speakers ago was talking about irritable bowel syndrome and rectal distension. I did those studies <laughs> while while imaging the brain right. And so there's the brain gut. Um, interaction is, is quite, quite profound. So, um, I mean, you, your final perception is obviously in the brain, but what contributes to that is, is whole body, certainly, yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of these, you know, uh, so-called biomarkers, so I, this NIH biomarker uh, workshop that you can see all those lectures, it was an amazing two-day uh, workshop and we're, we're, um, we're coming up with recommendations um, from that workshop, we're writing it up now. And um, only a very small, small, small segment of that two-day workshop focused on brain imaging. Like there was just a handful of us that were brain imagers. Everything else was, was uh, blood-borne, immunological, um, psychological, all sorts of things. So, um, so there, you know, to, come, to have to put somebody into a scanner to make a decision, that's a pretty expensive and time-consuming um, thing to do with a lot of um, expertise required to, to interpret that. If we can come up with a, a very easy behavioral marker. So that, that study, that ketamine study, the temporal summation of pain was just as good a predictor as looking at brain connectivity. So, you know, I can measure temporal summation of pain in, in 60 seconds. So why not just do that? Right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.